I think learning generosity is extremely important. You have to give up a certain part of yourself. You have to deal with control. And, well, I've just written a book about free improvisation. And one of the things that comes up constantly is this issue of control. You know, do I want to control 100% of the situation all the time? Um, or do I want to let, uh, am I able to let things go? One of the things you find quite quickly if you work in free improvisation is that you can't control the whole of the, the situation. You have to exceed some control, you have to learn to accept that certain things go on that you're not particularly happy with. Maybe they really confront your idea of what's good or bad, you know, what's constructive or destructive, what's positive or negative. Um, and you have to learn a lot of acceptance. And then you have to find ways of asserting yourself in that situation without trying to take complete control. A lot of people find that so difficult. And, um, you know, the ones who get it, you see them kind of relax into it, eventually, over a period of time. And they're not trying to stop people from doing things. They're not trying to take over the situation. It's very hard, and in a way it goes against the grain of, of the way we live and the way we learn. There are these strange sounds which are accompanying what I say, you know, the trains and sounds from outside. And um, Maybe years ago they would have bothered me, but I think that's very much part of the texture of life. And it's a question of drawing attention to this aspect of life and intensifying it and creating a deeper engagement with the way you live. I have this terrible work ethic, I suppose. So, as soon as I'm in a new situation, I'm thinking I need to justify my presence in this. I need to, I need to be doing something useful. And the first thing I did was um, think about how I wanted to use the chair situation. Um, how I wanted to use that to extend what I've already been doing. I've been at LCC for 16 years now, so um, I have a, a way of doing things, a strategy I suppose, but I wanted to think about how I could extend that. And one of the things that has really frustrated me, particularly in recent years, to some degree working in academia but also outside academia, is the way we exchange ideas. And that seems to me to have become so um, rigid, so formalised, so stereotypical. So I felt this was an opportunity for, for me to work on that, to, to try to um, present some alternatives. So that was my aim. and. I think the other thing was um, to work with students in collaborative ways. You know, not so much me in a pedagogical relationship, you know, in a professorial relationship, but as an equal, you know, a, a performer who is discovering things, um, as a thinker and a theorist who is still discovering things, and to work in collaborative ways and then um, putting them in more or less professional situations where they're working with me um, in you know, quite prestigious things. What that allows, I think, is preparation. So, to give an example, a concrete example of that, I was invited to do a performance in the Whitechapel Gallery's 
Music for Museums series. They were very interested in um, Fluxus pieces. And I, for years, have been using one particular Fluxus piece by a Japanese artist, Miyako Shomi, called Boundary Music. And she wrote this piece at the beginning of the 1960s. And it's, it's a difficult piece and it's a simple piece at the same time. I mean, it seems simple at face value, but the deeper you go into it, the more complicated it becomes. So it's a great piece to use to work with students. And I've been using this piece in the improvisation classes I do every year at LCC. So I thought, well, we'll present that piece, but we'll workshop it. And I workshopped it with, partly with the MA sound art students from LCC, but by that time, one of the things I was finding with this chair role was that I could work with students from any of the colleges and from any practice. So by that time, I'd sort of picked up, um, there was an illustration student from Camberwell, for example, who was suddenly had this epiphany about sound and listening, which was fantastic to see, you know. So she got involved. <coughs> and, and the workshop really begins by saying, what does it mean to talk about a boundary? Make your sound faint as possible to a boundary condition, whether the sound is given birth to as a sound or not. At the performance, instruments, human bodies, electronic apparatus, and all the other things may be used. Once you start thinking about boundaries, <laughs> it's endless. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's, it's personal, it's biological, it's, it's political, and it, it goes on and on and on. And um, I think you can bring any of those ideas to, to the performance of this piece through. Really. And there doesn't have to be a consistency in the group. Um, that's another thing about it. I mean, she, she uses this fantastic expression, um, what is it? Um, all the other things. <laughs> all, the other <laughs> <laughs> all the other things. Um. <laughs> Uh, my personal interpretation um, or the way that I would approach this is to potentially uh, try and evoke sounds um, in the imagination of uh, the audience and or performer. Okay, good, good. Um, so let's begin with working with that. My own education as an art student was, was pretty catastrophic, really. I dropped out of two colleges. I never even finished a course. You know, I studied graphic design and fine art. I did a foundation course. And it gave me a bit of a problem with educational institutions. So when I was invited into LCC initially as a visiting research fellow, I had to find a position for myself where I could function, you know, without having this chip on my shoulder about the whole thing. And then I started to get invited to give lectures at academic conferences and keynotes very often. And I didn't really know how to deal with it. And for a while I was writing papers. And I got to the point of thinking, this is really not me. Um, I think it's boring. The writing I'm doing is boring. The delivery is boring. Um, but y you have a problem that there are expectations of a certain density of knowledge that comes through in those situations. And it's very hard to improvise that, even though I'm an improviser. And um, I had to work out a tactic 
to deal with that. And gradually over the years I've begun to mix performance with um, a more conventional form of talking about what I do or what the subject is. And <coughs> it's really about listening. It begins from a kind of silence and it's about listening. And I think that <coughs> activating that sense, and you can talk about activating that sense, because uh, the emphasis in academia is so much on physiocentrism and text. So many people are really not particularly aware of how they use listening or how sound functions. So reduced material, uh, yeah, it's sort of engaging more with silence, um, not, yeah, engaging with materials that I have no idea what this, the sonic um, outcomes are. Um, yeah. Okay. And in relation to that, how did you find this piece about music connected with what you were doing? So the, um, at the time as well, I was playing um, pieces by James Saunders. I don't know if you've come across James Saunders, and he was also um, very interested in the sort of accidental sounds that happen when you're playing extremely quietly or um, sort of maybe moving the bow really, really, really slowly, and the, the sounds that happen as a as a kind of an accident of those. Um, uh, actions um, and I think that's kind of where I was at the time of, of this yeah there's a whole sort of um, using huge amount of silences in uh, performances um, this kind of very precarious um, kind of playing by sticking things on the violin um, and also these accidental sounds that would would sort of just happen and um, and, I, and I was also playing quite a lot of Manfred Verder scores as well, which is sort of just sometimes just uh, sentences, um, maybe just placing one note in a whole performance that may last 20 minutes to half an hour and really sort of being quite specific about when you're going to actually play that note or that sound. Um, mm. So th so th this score was kind of mm. felt quite a uh, natural and easy thing for me to explore at the time. And I don't think I really thought much about it because I was sort of <laughs> um, doing a lot of that anyway. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Precarious is a good word, I think. I mean, the greatest sound is the smallest sound that you can listen to, right? I mean, uh, it it really depends on how focused you listen to sound because like it's kind of perceptual things. Like if you listen to sound, a uh, very focused, it becomes something so loud to you. Yeah. And what well, in his in her piece is quite the same thing actually. Like if you take your most focused to to something, it becomes something that so loud, but it doesn't probably like it doesn't go to the same kind of loudness to the other people. It just only mean to you to be loud. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm. We're getting into deep philosophy. Here. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So let's do it. I think we're in a situation now where we don't really know what will happen in the future. Technology changes very quickly and the, the way people think about technology or the ingenuity they apply to how technology can be used, that's very, very rapid. 
and totally unpredictable. Um, and a lot of that comes from teamwork, and a lot of it comes from understanding or half understanding, you know, these big aspects of life, like how do we connect with each other? And how do we use our senses? And what are the overlaps between the senses? Um, there's a kind of intuitive move into these areas of human existence, human consciousness, human connectedness, or disconnectedness. That is taking us into areas that we don't really understand and are very, very new. And at the same time, exciting and disturbing. So um, I think students need to be equipped in quite different ways. You know, it's just about commercial nouns or something. That it seems to me is not enough because <coughs> you need to think in completely different ways and often not thinking about money. You know, often the things that make money are just created for a completely different reason. Yeah. So, um, it's this opening up of intuition and, and opening up to the way other people do things. You know, being able to listen to people to understand what they're doing and to be able to get it quickly. Moving is also a response to what you listen to because like, uh, it is what dance is about. Like, like why is the audience, they must have to be like a, 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 like a frozen vampire <laughs> and then <laughs> yeah, and listen to your uh, stuff um, so legit. I mean, in a legit way. Yeah, what's I'm thinking about? If like they can actually like, uh, well, listen but in a way in not in a common way to listen to your Fro stuff yeah frozen vampire <laughs> <laughs> that's very good I, that's the biggest boundary in a way mm. one of the, this we're talking yeah. audience performer mm. yeah. and uh, like boundary music should really address that mm. in some way from my experience I think some people will go for it, some people won't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And some people can get very angry, mm -hmm. and you have to be prepared for that, and mm -hmm. think about how you're going to deal, deal with it. Mm -hmm. Some people will be very embarrassed, and some people will really enjoy it. Um, and mm -hmm. it's about intuition, I think, sensing who might be a good person and who might not be. <laughs> When I worked as a music critic um, in the 80s, I was sent to review a Barry Manilow concert. <laughs> and he does this thing where he invites a woman on stage to sing with him. What's your name? Kathy. Kathy from, from where? Neither. And they film it. And then immediately they Almost immediately afterwards, they give her a videotape of, of what's just happened. Mm. Uh, and it was an incredible thing because, I mean, obviously there were lots of women there who want, really wanted to... Don't ask me why. <laughs> lots of women who really wanted to sing with Barry Manilow. And it was... He was very good with it, you know, because it was on the edge of humiliation. But it was actually very kind of generous and sensitive at the same time. Um, but you could imagine how something like that could tip over mm. into being really cruel and nasty. Mm. Um, and I think it's not so different, um, you know, not being very narrow and involving somebody in your performance. Um, it's, it's partly how you do it. <laughs>
Does anybody else uh, want to add anything at this point? Uh, Winnie, you haven't said much. Are you okay? Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, in my interpretation, I want to tie us. Tie us? Yeah. Okay. And because we, I want to make some restriction uh, for every performance. Yeah. And this kind of, because you, you will make your own thing and you will move your body yeah. and your body and the movement from your body will link to my, my object. Okay. So um, the boundary is between the uh, bound is between the body movements from the performance and the object. Okay, so okay let's do it. Let's do it. There'll be a lot of instances in the future where everything is collaborative. You know, people work in teams and people will have different specialisms in teams. But they'll all have to understand something about each other for it to function properly. And students who've never worked collaboratively, they're going to find problems in adjusting to that situation. Whereas students who've learned to work collaboratively will um, fit into it quite easily. And for the past 10 years I've been running improvisation classes at LCC. And I always say to them, <coughs> I'm not trying to train you to be good musical improvisers. It's more about this challenge of Working in a group of people who are all very different, they all have different tastes, they all have different ideas about life, different approaches, um, and somehow the aim is to find a way of reconciling all of this difference and to work together productively as a group. And that collaborative skill is the most useful thing, if that's learned. I mean, some people can't do it. Some people just, they don't come back after a week or two weeks, because it's just, they're, they're too, <coughs> they're too locked into their own individual, individualism. You can be an extreme individual in that situation, but you can also find a way to work as a group. And if you can get that balance, then you've learned something extremely valuable. And the rest of it doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't, whether we're making good music or whatever, that's not so important. But that skill, and I think it is a skill, of learning to work in groups um, and keeping your own integrity at the same time, is incredibly useful and I believe will be incredibly useful in the future. <laughs>